Well, good day, everyone. Um, this is Glenn Bloomhorst, President of National Peace Corps Association, and welcome to this very special event today, our panel discussion uh, called Shaping the, peace, the Field, the Peace Corps and Peace Building Through a Diversity Lens. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our event today. We have an exciting agenda and some great uh, panelists that are going to be joining us today. Uh, this is a presentation made possible by the collaborative effort of Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, Institute for Economics and Peace, and the National Peace Corps Association. I'm joined by several of my colleagues here who I'll be introducing uh, momentarily, but I want to give a special thanks to Miriam Foote, my colleague here at the National Peace Corps Association for her leadership and helping organize and frame and guide this conversation today. We're also joined by uh, colleagues from, uh, from the uh, Institute for Economics and Peace, in particular, Michael Collins, Executive Director, who will be joining us on the panel conversation. A very special guest, Sajid Gandhi, who is the Senior Professional Staff Member at the US House of Representatives on the Committee for Foreign Affairs. And finally, our dear friend over at the Peace Corps and grateful for her attendance and participation today, Darlene Grant, uh, who is a returned Peace Corps volunteer currently serving as Senior Advisor to the Director of the Peace Corps. Very grateful for them uh, taking time out of their busy days to spend with us on this panel conversation. We have a very, very special guest too that I'll introduce in more detail here in a moment, but I uh, wanted to just uh, thank you for joining this important conversation. Uh, a bit about well, first, I served in the Peace Corps myself in Guatemala, and so that was the start of a career that really was uh, focused on international peace building and international people-to-people uh, -people type uh, development, and uh, recently came to National Peace Corps Association about eight years ago as the, as the president of this organization. And that grassroots experience that I share with many other RPCVs uh, from our service in the Peace Corps is what guides to me today and has transformed my perspective of the world and the commitment that I have for helping make it a better place. National Peace Corps itself was established um, in 1979. It is a 501c3 social impact organization. Uh, we are at the center of a community of over 240,000 individuals who share the Peace Corps experience. Uh, we exist to essentially serve a united and vibrant Peace Corps community that includes uh, currently, well, not currently at the moment, but normally currently serving volunteers, uh, uh, future volunteers, return Peace Corps volunteers, current and former Peace Corps staff, host country nationals, and anyone who has a family, friend, or are um, interested in the Peace Corps is a part of our community. We're joined together as a community to help create a better world. Our mission, simply put, is to help champion lifelong commitment to Peace Corps ideals. Our three goals are to help Peace Corps be the best that it can be, to help empower our members and our affiliate groups to thrive and do best what they do, and to amplify the Peace Corps community's global social impact. Among uh, those efforts, we advocate for and contribute to the continued improvement and expansion of the Peace Corps itself. Uh, we would like to see every American who wants to serve to be able to serve in the Peace Corps and have that opportunity. Uh, as Peace Corps resumes operations, we're looking forward to it to, to continue to establish its presence around the world, as well as become an opportunity for more and more Americans to serve their country in uh, peace uh, related efforts. Uh, part of our effort also is to work with the Peace Corps and uh, to advocate for um, uh, the benefits and entitlements and health care of volunteers and return volunteers. And more recently, we've really been working collaboratively with the agency as well as our own community to help retool and reshape uh, the Peace Corps as it reemerges from this pandemic as a more diverse and innovative organization for the, for the changed world that we live in now. So this panel discussion will focus in large part on that conversation about this new Peace Corps for the changed world and our, our role as a community uh, to contribute to it and the role that we can play through partnerships like the ones that we share today here with IEP, with WCAPS and, with, and others in helping make that possible. So it's my pleasure without further ado, just to move forward in our agenda here and introduce to you our very special guest um, and the person who really is behind making all of this happen, I should say, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. Uh, her credentials are a long list of achievements and accomplishments and, and many things that she's accomplished in her life and career. Um, and so I want to just highlight a few of those things. She is the founder and executive director <clears throat> of WCAPS. She also chairs the steering committee of Organizations in Solidarity, which is an organization that we are a part of as well um, and that she founded in 2020. She is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and a senior fellow at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. 
She's an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and the Georgetown University Law Center. She's a lecturer at the University of Virginia uh, Batten School, and she is a professor, professorial lecturer at the George Washington Elliott School of International Affairs. She also is a special, as was a special envoy under the Obama administration, uh, special envoy and coordinator for threat reduction programs in the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, prior to her role in government, uh, she was uh, in, prior to 19 or 2009 as in her role in government. She worked at the Ford Foundation as the program officer for U.S. foreign and security policy and conflicts, and she served as counsel for the National Commission on Terrorist Acts upon the United States for the 9/11 Commission. She holds a PhD from the University of Virginia, an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center, an MPA from the State University of New York in Albany and a JD degree from Albany Law School and a BA from Amherst College. She is a retired US Naval Reserve officer and she received numerous awards for her military service. She is a member of the New York State Bar. She has yet to serve in the Peace Corps, um, but her, her credentials, as you can see, merit her being uh, honored today as a, as a honorific uh, Peace Corps volunteer among us as well. I'm going to pass the baton here to Ambassador Jenkins and thank her again for her leadership on this front, on these very important conversations that we're having in our community. And then to our panel, dis panel discussion to follow, she will introduce as a moderator, those individuals and the conversation with them. So thank you again for joining us today. Ambassador Jenkins to you. Great, thank you very much, Glenn, for those very, very kind words. And it really is my honor and pleasure to be a part of this and to join with uh, such uh, really impressive organizations and wonderful panelists for our discussion today. Um, I wanted to do just a couple things before I turn it over to our amazing panelists. Um, I've been asked to say a little bit about WCAPS and a little bit about uh, Oars and Solidarity and also uh, some of our interactions at WCAPS with the Peace Corps. Um, so first of all, WCAPS was established in 2017. Um, you can find a lot more about us on the website, since I won't be going into a lot of detail right now um, at WCAPS.org. But we, you know, the, the reason why um, I started the organization really because there was a, I realized there was a gap in the field in terms of a focus of voices of people of color, particularly women of color, in peace and security, um, and having a, a, a network and a way in which uh, we could work together and promote our voices and the importance of our perspectives in foreign in uh, foreign policy and security policy. Um, so we started in 2017, and um, through that time, we've been able to do a number of wonderful things. And I said, like, like I said, you can check us out on the website. But one of the things that we uh, really enjoyed was working on a, a report that you can find by going to our website and and clicking on uh, the uh, looking at our past reports which we did for a number of the Peace Corps uh, volunteers who returned after, at, at, right after COVID-19 had started. Um, and Miriam uh, Foote, who I will be also introducing, uh, was a part of that, uh, that report. And it was really a, a momentous time for me to learn not only about the, uh, about the Peace Corps and the wonderful volunteers who were in the Peace Corps, but some of the challenges that they were facing. And so after that report, WCAPS remained, and I remained very interested in, in the Peace Corps and its development and its, and its, uh, and its, and its changes and, and things that they are considering right now. Um, and Orgs and Solidarity, as Glenn mentioned very briefly, um, it's, a, it's, an or, it's, a, it's an entity that's a part of WCAPS, um, and it now has about 250 organizations, as well as individuals who are working together in different working groups to promote 12 commitments that they all signed up to when they signed the solidarity statement uh, following the killing of George Floyd. Uh, this is something you can also see uh, on its own website, orgsinsolidarity.org, um, to get more information and background on that. Um, so now what I want to do is introduce our panelists, and we can talk a lot more about um, our Peace Corps and working in areas of diversity and what can be done, what should be done. Um, so first, I want to introduce uh, my colleague, Marion Foote, who was actually, uh, when, when I started uh, WCAPS in 2017, she was on our initial Young Ambassadors uh, group. Uh, Miriam is a returned Peace Corps volunteer. She served in Benin from 2018 to 2020 uh, as a community outreach specialist, specialist in advocacy and administrative associate 
now at MPCA and, and also is a WCAPS member. So very happy to see that she was, uh, that she joined MPCA um, after her time at the Peace Corps. Also Michael Collins from the Institute for Economics and Peace. Sajid Gandhi, Senior Professional Staff Member at the U.S. House of Representative Committee on Foreign Affairs. And last but certainly not least, Darlene Grant, another RPCV Senior Advisor to Jody Olson now at the Peace Corps. So welcome all of our panelists. Um, and we have a lot to talk about in just a little time because we only have an hour. And so I have some uh, questions that I'd like to pose to the group, and then I have a couple for individuals, and then we would like to turn it over to uh, the audience for questions. So the first question that I'm going to ask, and maybe a couple of you can respond, is how does the Peace Corps fit into the peace building community? And I will just ask whoever wants to uh, respond to that to please do so. Sounds like a good question for me, Ambassador. Um, I'd like to start. Good morning, uh, good evening to those of you who are joining us from other countries around the world. Um, I, I was thinking about this quite a bit when invited uh, to join this August group, and thank you for that invitation. And my initial um, knee-jerk reaction is always to, to hearken to the words on the steps, the University of Michigan steps back in 1960 when uh, a group of over uh, 10,000, uh, uh, it's an extraordinarily large group of Mich Michigan uh, students um, were asked, would you be willing to serve your country and the cause of peace by living and working in the developing world? Uh, and, and given the fact that there are a lot of return Peace Corps volunteers on the call, I would assume they would say, yeah, 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 we heard that speech a hundred times, Darlene. Sounds like you used to be a country director. Yeah. But I, I hearken to that speech because of um, a growing definition that I have for peace building as a long-term process of engaging people to talk to listen, to repair relationships, and to reform institutions. And as I use that as a working definition and connect it to that charge, to that challenge of willing to serve, I think about what we arm volunteers with as they go into communities into villages, into towns. Um, with, um, we call it a uh, participatory analysis approach and community action approach. And I love to talk about the three Ds, developing relationships, discover, dream, design, and then deliver to, to bring a project to life, to bring a dream to life. And, and so the way we fit into that in, in, in that, that, that more um, grab the heart way is, is that. And on the ground, it's, it's what we do. Um, how do we develop relationships? And for me, how do we help people dream? Because you have to be able to consider that the world can be a better place to be able to participate in um, peace building. Um, and, and so I think that's what, why people join the Peace Corps, that kernel of a dream that the world can be a better place. And then we have volunteers going to countries, over 61 countries, sitting next to students, sitting next to farmers, sitting next to fishery folks and, and, and folks who are in community and economic development saying, tell me your dream. What's your dream? Help, help me think about your dream before we build a project because that dream should inform the project. Um, 
that, that's my initial response to the question. I could go on and on, but th thanks for asking. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to kind of jump in there if, if, if that's okay. Number one, because I'm really excited to talk about this, um, but also because I, I can perhaps kind of sort of offer a, a, an external perspective. Um, um, so I think that there are kind of sort of two uh, key contributions that, that Peace Corps is making to the peace building uh, field. Number one is with regards to sort of the development and peace um, nexus, and, and, and still there seems to be sort of relatively little understanding as to the connection of, of, of between the two, between development and, and, and peace building. I mean, there's an intuitive understanding of this, but there's there's very sort of little little measurement in between the, those. You know, for example, there are sort of development organizations that've got extremely well developed uh, programming and clear goals and processes, and they're working it in dozens of, dozens of countries. And then on the other hand, there are sort of organizations that are more propensed, if you will, to call themselves peace building organizations, which perhaps sort of have more of a focus on social justice, on, on human rights, on mediation, conflict resolution, uh, et cetera. And I, I think sort of the Peace Corps is, is one of those sort of very rare organizations that, that straddles those two incredibly well. I mean, number one, it has the, the mission is, is to promote world peace, right? So obviously extremely uh, peace-centered, but the main focus or the sort of the action areas, if you will, um, are, are much broader education, health, you know, environment, youth and development, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then add, of course, the diplomacy element that, that Darlene was sort of referring to and the learning exchange element that, that uh, Darlene was referring to. Um, and this kind of sort of coincides with, with the strengthening, if you will, of the sort of the various fundamental capacities or, or qualities that constitute peaceful societies that IEP tries to, tries to, to, to measure. Um, so, you know, one could sort of argue that this this broader approach to peace building is, is by far the most um, effective. And the Peace Corps really does have a very systemic approach to, to peace building, and potentially one that perhaps other peace building organizations, at least some, don't 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 have, you know. Um, and then the se second sort of thing I wanted to know very quickly is, is this idea of sort of the cultural exchange and the multiculturalism uh, further building on, on what uh, Darlene was mentioning here. This kind of sort of opportunity that Peace Corps creates to be able to sort of share and learn new perspectives and, and, and ideas and like compare different values, but in a, in a, in a very non-threatening um, way. I mean, you know, the development and peace building field is kind of sort of plagued by, by Westernism, um, this sort of unconscious sort of belief that, that Western culture or practices is, is best and other societies should be living up to these particular sort of um, ideals. Um, and then also kind of sort of generally when you look at development programs, I mean, we're getting much, much, much better, but from my experience in, in the development field also, the, the amount of kind of sort of real um, international staff integration um, uh, within the, the, the context in which it's working remains sort of really, really poor. And I think that one of the things that Peaceful does really well is sort of instill this really deep, deep appreciation for, for local culture. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of, Funny for me, leading up to this and, and watching multiple kind of sort of uh, video testimonials of returned Peace Corps volunteers, that deep realization that they that they each have about oh wow, you know this this tremendous diversity of thinking, these 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 you know great you know completely different sets of values and even sort of morals are sort of radically radically different depending on where you where you go. So that kind of sort of rich realization really gets to the essence of, of peace building. Um, which I think then accompanies them for the rest of their of their life, or for the rest of your life, I should say. So, uh, so I think those might might be that. Great. So I think we're actually going to go to the next question, if you don't mind. And this one is to uh, Sajit. Um, and I'd like to get from you your perspective on you know from what you've heard so far, and how can the Hill engage in some of the um, ideals and initiatives of the Peace Corps and uh, and also diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sure, and, and thanks for having me um, with this really terrific group. It's a really privilege. Uh, you know, I think what's interesting about the Congress is that so many, you know, we have a long history of actually returned Peace Corps volunteers being part and members of Congress and on the staffs. And because of that position, you have a lot of um, members who, who really understand or have seen the value um, of the Peace Corps, both in terms of how it can um, contribute to host countries, but sort of the impact it has um, on the Americans that are participating in the programs and on, on the sort of broader topic of peace building. Um, before we all went into lockdown, um, this was actually 
sadly now a year ago, um, I was on a CODEL um, with a, a few, it was bipartisan, a few members, uh, and we went to Nepal. And I would say one of the highlights of that trip, um, not just for me, but for the members was engaging with the new Peace Corps volunteers that were there um, on the orientation trip. You know, hearing everyone's stories, the, 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 the backgrounds of people, why they were there, their experiences um, living with host communities and, and host families, which, you know, can be um, jarring for, for many. I, and I think just sort of hearing the, the, the stories of, of everyone really meant something to the members because they saw these people actually taking the time, seeing the importance of this at a young age to kind of go and help. Um, and so that actually translates really um, into this theme that I think many members of Congress go into their jobs with is, is public service. Um, and so, you know, there's this, there's this direct correlation and impact and, you know, um, so there's this tie and there's a lot of interest in that way. Um, and I think in terms of the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece, um, you know, we have seen, I think over the last six months or so, a renewed interest um, by, a, by a partisan group of members um, in, in ensuring that this becomes, comes to the forefront of a lot of the work we're doing in the national security workspace. I don't want to kind of mix Peace Corps with national security. There are some ties. We can sort of leave it separate from that. But there is this understanding of in our institutions, we need to do better at this. Um, and I think that there's a role for the Congress to play. Uh, there's an opportunity, and I think we want to meet meet this moment with some some thinking, big thinking about how to address some of these gaps. Um, I think too often we maybe start with low expectations on this issue, and so what we'll end up doing is saying let's improve recruitment. And I think that's important, but that is the baseline. That is stuff that we can we can easily and targeted in a targeted way address, but that shouldn't be enough. And that shouldn't be the, the sort of bulk of saying like, we've expanded the recruitment and we're gonna stop there. Um, I think a lot of, it becomes a talking point, right? We're gonna, we're gonna focus on diversity and inclusion by addressing recruitment. So let's also talk about pipelines. Let's also talk about equity. Let's also talk about how do you ensure that people who don't see this even as a potential career option or an option to start your career see the Peace Corps as an actual opportunity. So I think that means starting younger and in different places. Um, you know, there are, there are ties with how we do this at the State Department where I grew up in central Pennsylvania, didn't even know the State Department or the Peace Corps was an option for me. And so not just being a person of color, but being from the middle of a state where, you know, people ask you where you're from and, you know, are you Philadelphia or Pittsburgh and actually not being from either, right? There's just this, this lack of awareness because it's not there. And so one, it's how do, we, how do we focus on making sure people are aware of these careers, but then if people don't have the means to take a career like this, how do you ensure that they're able to, to, to take a position with the Peace Corps? Many people come out of college with you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So taking a position at the Peace Corps is not something that's an option. Well, how do we, how do we address that gap? Uh, and so I think the Congress wants to be a partner with the Peace Corps in terms of looking at legislative fixes to some of these problems. Um, it's also, let's look at some of the pipeline challenges. Um, what are we doing to ensure that there are um, more country directors? Um, and then people who understand some of the struggles of being, um, you know, my specialty or the area that I cover is South Asia. And, you know, we talk about racism in the United States, but it also is pervasive in the region. So being a, a Peace Corps volunteer of color in South Asia is not the same. And so making sure that we also have that kind of support system built in and dealing with these issues. And so I think the Congress, and I know this is a, a bit of a long-winded answer, but we wanna be a partner with the Peace Corps. And I think either we can take our own steps legislatively to address some of these problems. I, they, these steps tend to be more meaningful when we have a partner in the agency to work with on addressing these challenges, rather than kind of just, big, maybe big footing is the wrong word, but implementing legislative change that's not going to be receptive with the agency. So key here is we want to be a partner. There is a strong interest in, in, in that partnership. And I think there's a lot of members who value the role and the impact that Peace Corps plays um, in, in peace building, but also in, in sort of demonstrating how the U.S. actually cares about lots of places in the world. Um, so I think that's, let me stop there because I went on long enough and I will get down from my soapbox now. <laughs> No, that's fine. Great. We want to hear all of that. So definitely don't apologize for, for letting us know what, 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 um, what the thinking is right now on the Hill. So we appreciate that. 
And like you, I mean, I grew up in, in the inner inner city, New York, and so I didn't really think about a lot of these issues, a lot of these uh, opportunities like Peace Corps until later in life. And so certainly agree with the idea of getting these word, getting the word out earlier uh, to young students uh, and, and working on that pipeline. Um, so let's turn to Miriam, who is uh, who actually just uh, was recently um, in Benin last year before coming home. Uh, a little earlier than planned because of COVID. Uh, maybe you could tell us about um, a little bit about uh, that experience, about the report that uh, you were such a strong part of with WCAPS. Um, and also maybe say a bit about uh, the role of your organization in, in uh, Origins and Solidarity. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I came back due to COVID in March and that has been a really enlightening experience, but it's also shown me some of the difficulties that volunteers come back. Um, and so I partnered with WCAPS and Ambassador Jenkins to kind of craft a report around the experiences of return volunteers and kind of the difficulties that they were having upon return. And through the report, we found, you know, there were issues with health insurance, um, you know, PUA benefits, NCE status. Um, and there were a plethora of diverse experiences as well as a plethora of, you know, challenges that volunteers were having. Um, and that just goes to show like how diverse our community is, but then also like how diverse these solutions also need to be to kind of make space for these volunteers, especially when they come back from their service. And so since then, um, after that, I've been working with NPCA and kind of, you know, working on advocacy issues as well. And um, NPCA is a signatory of the WCAPS Orgs and Solidarity Project. Uh, which is a project to kind of bring in um, nonprofits and all different kinds of organizations um, that are interested in kind of pursuing um, diversity and inclusion within the workspace and within the work that they do. Um, yeah, and there's a link to it in the chat box. And so uh, NPC is signed on to this and there's 12, about 12 commitments and there's over 250 organizations and individuals that have signed on to this. And we're all committed to kind of finding different ways and solutions to kind of um, introduce inclusion and equity into the work that we do. And so there's going to be a conference as well on the 25th and the 24th um, targeted towards, you know, getting more um, people of color, women of color, more diverse people um, into these um, workspaces and kind of having webinars um, and activities around that, especially because there isn't 100% uh, you know, clear steps on how to kind of bring these into our organizations and how do we become more inclusive. And so we're working together to try to find out those solutions and talk together and see how different organizations are tackling these issues um, and how they're working through that. And so NPCA is working through that as well. You know, we all have our histories and we're all working to try um, and kind of forge a path where we can be more inclusive and diverse and kind of have more of those voices in. But we also understand that that's a long way to go and it takes actual work and not just signing on to a document, but it takes continuous and actual um, actions within our organizations. And so that's something that we've been working on um, and we're hoping to continue working on. And yeah, please feel free to check a look at the um, links that are posted in the chat box. Um, and PCA also has a report that we've done and that we've worked on. Um, and so that's Peace Corps Connect to the Future. And in the report, we actually have a chapter dedicated to fostering diversity and inclusion in the Peace Corps. And this is something that you see throughout um, the report as well. You see it through recruitment, you see it through re-collaborating our programs, you see it throughout kind of the report. And so these are things that we're also working on within NPCA and things that we're collaborating as well with WCAPS to kind of try and address in our communities and find different solutions to these problems as well. Thank you, Miriam. <clears throat> and I think we're going to, oh good, the, uh, my colleague Netta just shared the, uh, the link to the, uh, the report that we did with uh, Peace Corps last year. <clears throat> so Darlene, if you don't mind, I'd like to come back to you with a question. Um, on these issues of diversify, uh, diversifying the Peace Corps, um, what are some long-term actions that can be taken to diversify the Peace Corps and the field, and what is being done now? Thank, uh, thank you, uh, and, and thank you, Myriam, and thank you, Sajid. Uh, you guys jumped all in my notes. This is wonderful, uh, and and Michael, I, I I love that 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 framing. Um, what are we doing now? Um, we are taking time during this pause from having volunteers in the field to really dive into the process of reviewing our structures, our programs, our policies, and identifying ways that we can best recruit. And to your point, Sajid, uh, Sajid uh, uh, support 
um, and, and move all the way through the continuum of the volunteer experience, um, individuals who apply to the Peace Corps, um, as well as staff. And that we, um, that we develop a staff and a volunteer corps that represents the tapestry of America, the cultures, the, um, the, the, the different points of views, et cetera. And, and to do that by ensuring they're, uh, they're safe, healthy, um, um, and well supported. Um, there are a number of approaches and I like to frame them in terms of the, again, the volunteer lifespan. There's some really exciting things going on in the recruitment arena. Um, we have a, a, a core of um, recruiters who are doing interesting things such as um, Instagram slams or what's it called? Instagram takeovers of college campus Instagram accounts during a certain period of time where they're pushing out Peace Corps information um, and really meeting Generation Z, if you will, where they are in, in the web space, in the social media space. We have uh, recruiters who are now not just uh, talking to students, but actually engaging high level um, um, deans and authorities within universities to be partners in talking to and engaging students in historically black, historically Hispanic serving and other institutions and universities. It's very exciting stuff that they're doing. Um, we have moving across the continuum, we really are looking at once, a vol once uh, someone is interested and um, uh, proceeds to apply um, for the first time, in uh, I think um, my notes would say about 30 years, we have increased the medical reimbursement for the exams, um, the dental exams, the medical exams that volunteers may, uh, that applicants may have to go through to get through the application process. That is a, such a win for the agency um, that it has been increased three times the rate that it historically has been. We are really looking at all of our communications um, to prospective volunteers, as well as to, vol uh, to serving volunteers and return volunteers with a new newsletter through the, through the um, Office of the Third Goal to see our, is our communication um, having the intended impact and reaching the intended audiences? Um, and are we considering our communications through that DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion lens, uh, and how we can do that much better? Um, and and I, I must talk about what's happening in the field. Some really exciting things. For example, we are having teams of host country national staff with HQ staff, headquarters staff here back in, in DC, who are building a, a uh, learning environment where learning is continuing about diversity, equity, and inclusion, challenges, issues, so that when our volunteers return back to the field, um, to a new world, that if they are using that, uh, that lens of dream and discover, that they, they are greeted by a team and communities who are ready to help in that process. Right? Um, teams in um, different countries are continuing dialogues by using books, by using film, um, and actually by using dialogues with our PCVs to talk about um, the world and the challenges we face today. Um, and and I'll, I'll close by, uh, by saying, um, we're finding ways to really look at using this new Zoom environment to reinforce our commitment to serving underserved communities and to use our strategies to look at countering marginalization 
again, two key areas of peace building. You know, so, so historically volunteers would be placed in villages and towns. What is that gonna look like in a new world, uh, in, in a COVID world? Um, and um, our teams in our post are really working on trying to solve and address that issue. Like you, Michael, I'm really uh, excited about this topic and, I'm, and Peace Corps is enthusiastic to work with uh, Congress about these things as well and in PCA. Oh, great, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Darlene. And that's actually a, a good uh, opportunity to segue over to Michael. Um, and I do want people to, if you have questions, audience, please put those in the chat because we're gonna be going to Q&A after, after this next question. Um, and so, Michael, at, at IEP, how is DEI integrated into the positive peace framework? Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was still thinking in the back of my mind whether Generation Z, is that, is that the generation now? <laughs> I'm, lo I'm losing track. Uh, yeah. I feel older and older every day. <laughs> um, so, yeah, abs absolutely, Bonnie. So, um, you know, DEI kind of, so... Positive peace for those who may kind of sort of be a bit a bit less familiar essentially refers to broadly the the, the attitudes institutions and structures that that uh, create and sustain peaceful uh, societies. We we at IP generally trying to kind of sort of measure that quantitatively to to the extent that that, that we can. And you know DEI does shine through in, in a, a number of ways, both in terms of terminology uh, terminology, but also sort of conceptually as well. So. You know, for, uh, for example, with regards to, to, to specific sort of pillars of positive peace, in the case of our framework, there's eight, uh, the pillar of acceptance of the rights of others, the pillar of uh, equ uh, equitable distribution of resources. Um, and then when looked at as sort of a, a system, if you will, because uh, all of these pillars sort of are, are interdependent um, and interrelated, other pillars such as high levels of human capital, good relations with neighbors, well-functioning government, low levels of corruption, uh, sound business environment, free flow of, of, of information. And then if you kind of sort of dig in, in into the, the data, there are sort of individual indicators that uh, include elements related to, to, to DEI. Um, you know, and if, if we look at sort of uh, race, gender, and ethnicity specifically, for example, elements related to group grievances, uh, gender inequality, exclusion by socioeconomic group, fractionalized, fractionalized elites, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What, one of the sort of the challenges, I suppose, that you could say um, that, that we have in terms of sort of measuring this uh, globally is that diversity becomes really sort of uh, quickly fraught because it, it's it's highly contextual. So, you know, for example, if you were to ask, are more diverse countries more peaceful, right? Seems like a very simple question that you should be able to get a, a simple answer to. Um, but question number one would be, okay, well, what constitutes more diverse? Um, are we talking racially? Are we talking ethnically? Are we talking about uh, a religion? Are we talking about political views? Just to kind of sort of name, name a few of those, right? Um, and, and then if you were to just take one of those, let's say purely an ethnic perspective, for example, um, some of the least peaceful countries on earth are, are also the most ethnically diverse, right? Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, has got uh, hundreds of sort of ethnic uh, groups, many of which are sort of in conflict uh, with, with one another. Um, but, but some of the most peaceful are also the most uh, uh, homogeneous, but that, that is, you know, can purely be sort of a definition of, of, of borders, for example. And I wanted to think of a specific uh, case. So take, take um, Europe, for example, right? Europe has been the most uh, 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 peaceful region on earth according to the Global Peace Index, which is a sort of measure of peacefulness that, that IEP puts out. Now, when you look at each country individually, they're actually very homogeneous uh, countries. They're less diverse racially, ethnically, religiously, and, and, and otherwise. But then if, if, you, if you look at the sort of the whole region, right, you can actually consider it highly diverse. You can get in a car and you can drive for four hours and you can, you know, cross five different countries and they all speak different languages and they all have different, you know, cultures and different definitions of, of cheese, essentially, right? Um, so, you know, at the same time, given that all of that diversity, then you take sort of like the levels of, of polarization that arose from the, the Syrian refugee crisis and you see that the continent as a whole still, still kind of sort of struggles with, with diversity. Um, you know, one thing that perhaps you could sort of say about, about, Europe is that that perhaps it's it's because each sort of uh, tribe, for lack of a better word, or nation has been able to sort of stake a stake a claim, but that's only relatively recently um, uh, true, right? Um, so 
the, the second part of this, the, the positive side is that I think sort of the inclusion aspect is, is a much better measure. Um, you know, and if we take sort of a broader definition of, of diversity, one that encompasses sort of all of, all of these aspects, perhaps sort of the, the best metric that we've come across um, linking sort of inclusiveness and, and peace is its correlation, uh, the correlation of, of peace with democracy. So uh, democracy, largely the definition that we sort of use um, is, is government based on majority rule, uh, consent of the governed, uh, the existence of free and fair elections, protection of minority rights, uh, and the respect for human rights, right, for example. Um, and then when we look at the global peace index and the positive peace index, two measures of peacefulness that we use, by far countries that are more democratic are more peaceful in nature. So that, that's not to say that sort of democracy is, is perfect by, by any means. In fact, sort of civil unrest has been increasing significantly in democracy as ha democracies as has a, a political polarization. They're also weakening wor worldwide. But one of the things that we see about democracy is that they kind of sort of provide this uh, sort of escape valve, if you will, for, for, for social tensions, right? And they, and they provide the tool to build social uh, cohesion and to sort of sort through or thrash out the various issues that any individual society is kind of sort of um, uh, trying to, to, to tackle. Uh, and essentially, because of that, they are diverse in all, of the, in all of their forms and therefore a lot more resilient, a lot more able to deal with a variety of different crises as well. So I don't know, that's kind of sort of the, the three-way link that I tried to make in that, in that regard. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so now we have a little bit of time for uh, questions and um, I see really two more statements than questions. So I wanna see if, if anyone has any responses. Um, one is focusing on women, and it says, I don't know if you've seen this in the e in the chat, ironically, given that women are in the majority of Peace Corps volunteers, it is my experience, both my own and stories from other RPCVs, that women in general, and particularly young women, are very much discriminated against in many Peace Corps sites. So there's no question mark at the end or no question asked, but I think it's more of, does anyone have a response to that or a thought on that point? I think I didn't catch the entire. I think that, I think the point, I think the point is, uh, the presumption is that there are majority women, majority of people in the Peace Corps volunteer are women. Yeah. And just the experience of, of, of Jillian from her own story and stories from others that women in general, and particularly young women, are very much discriminated against in many Peace Corps sites. Interesting. So, I mean, it can, it's a comment. Um, it doesn't require a response, but I did want to at least put it out there in case anyone wanted to respond to it. Um, and let's see. And why you're thinking that? <laughs> yeah. I could ask ask you another question for uh, for Dr. Grant. Um, how would you characterize the current prospects within the agency uh, to add anti-racism as a core PC PCV expectation? There, there is a conversation that is happening at the Peace Corps on looking at the ten long-standing core expectations that volunteers and staff are asked to um, abide by and, and be guided by in their service and their work. Uh, and what we're wrestling with is how do we interject a core expectation of your service that you would um, be uh, do anti-racism work and that you would conduct yourself uh, based on the tenets of anti-racism um, and th how challenging it is to phrase that in a way that someone knows that if they are not able to meet that expectation, they are fairly and equitably uh, assessed on that core value, right, on that core expectation. So I, I'm happy to say we are looking at that, but with adding, adding that, we are also charged and challenged with how, 
how do we hold people accountable to that fairly, equitably across every single volunteer? Um, um, and uh, it, it's good work. It, 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 it's a good uh, question to, to, to try to tackle. Can I add to your, sorry, sorry. I, I mean, I think this is a fascinating question because it's yeah. something that we are, we're grappling with. And, it, and I think it's sort of levels of how do you describe anti-racism? I mean, when we talk about different titles or just different descriptions of what should be in a position description, you know, a commitment to equal opportunity. How do you measure that? Is that a question that we should be asking? I mean, my view is it's a, certainly a question we should be asking. And I think people should be thinking, what am I doing to advance this cause of equal opportunity? Uh, and I think in some ways it, it goes, I think when you sort of talk about anti-racism, what does that mean? I mean, is that equal opportunity or are we talking about something else? And I think there's different scales of this that we have to look at and say, how do we apply this to a variety of position descriptions or how we hold people accountable to sort of this base? I mean, in my mind, having a demonstrated commitment to equal opportunity is baseline. Like that should be something basic. When we do, when we, when we advertise jobs, when we interview candidates, when we talk about people that want to take X, Y, and Z position. But I think that it's an, it has different meanings to different people. And, and then I think the second and more difficult question is how do we measure this? Mm -hmm. Can you hold, once, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and once we do begin that conversation and start, start incorporating that, ensuring that we create a system of training, self-training, self-guided training, where folks can raise up their understanding of complex DEI concepts um, so that they can um, not just check the box, oh, of course I do, of course I stand for that, but that they can also demonstrate it in their performance in, in, challenge, in, in, in nuanced ways, if you will, yeah. I, we don't wanna create a check the box environment for DEI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. No, please go ahead. Sorry. I wanna just say, I mean, I think you're right. We don't wanna create a check the box, but how do we start? Yeah, check the box. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, yeah, yeah, is, that, yeah. is that the baseline? Let, like, let's just say, right, let's yeah, start checking yeah. the box and yeah, then yeah, yeah. kind of be a little bit more, I don't wanna say thoughtful because I think in some ways these are like, these are limited things that you know we should be doing. It's, it's this point of when, when, I'll take it back to my, like a specific experience. It's not necessarily Peace Corps, but State Department. People have been for years, um, and Ambassador Jenkins, good luck with this. <laughs> but people have been talking about for years, like we need to improve the State Department's, um, the, the diversity and representation of the State Department. We have now for 30 years seen the same problem, right? Which is there is a barrier to, to promotion and to advancement for people of color. The GAO, the Government Accountability Office, did a report on this in 1989. And they did a second report on this in 2020 with the same finding, mm -hmm. right? And the same recommendation keeps on getting pulled around as like, let's focus on recruitment. And then we'll 30 years down the line have a pool of talented, talented people who will be at the mid, that didn't happen, right? So I think at some point we have to start checking the box and then maybe um, as we do that, think of what are the next best steps to address this problem. Exactly. Okay, so we have another question. Um, how can the Peace Corps collaborate more, more with existing, more and better, with existing peace building or development organizations and host countries to have larger and long term impact? And would like to answer that one? This is. This is um... <laughs> Just, just, just to add, sort of, a, 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 um, and this is this is completely speculative and hypothetical on, on, on my behalf. When, when I, I had the the um, opportunity to speak with uh, Jody when I when I first started with with IEP, she mentioned that um, that uh, PC was in the process of developing um, country country assessments or their own form of, of country assessments based on the experiences of Peace Corps volunteers and return Peace Corps volunteers, right? And to be able to do this on a rolling basis. Now, I don't know how sort of advanced this is or, or whether that idea went out the window, I'm not sure. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, individual Peace Corps volunteers develop significant, significant uh, uh, expertise and cultural expertise in these, in these particular uh, countries. So to the extent that there still remains a deep need for kind of sort of this nexus between 
local communities and the international community, I think that the, the uh, Peace Corps is uniquely sort of qualified uh, in many ways to be able to kind of sort of provide that, uh, that liaison. Mm -hmm. okay. I, would, I would also state that um, Dr. Olson is no longer with the Peace Corps. And so we now have acting director Carol Spahn. And so we're in that, in that transition phase uh, of leadership, which is extraordinarily exciting. Um, as we move forward to having these conversations. I would, I would add to Michael's point that the, the on the ground work of volunteers, surprisingly, uh, as a country director, I would sit down with volunteers and the depth and breadth of relationships that they have um, created in integrating in these communities, um, uh, oftentimes include peace building entities in the countries on the ground. You add to that the importance of our host country national staff and their connections to the peace building community within their own countries and how that can come together and grow to fruition um, with, with projects. Uh, um, um, so I, I think it is a space that has potential to grow, particularly as we are in a um, kind of a, a social networking world. Great, and we have time for one more question. So I think this is a quick one. Um, is there a PC, uh, Peace Corps info slash recruiting Zoom available for use in schools? One of the most exciting projects that has started uh, post post um, evacuation in this, is this new environment we're communicating in is a series of as needed um, communications um, to different audiences that are being developed by our recruiting team. And they're, they're really um, slick. Um, again, towards that meeting, it's called on-demand recruitment using the power of pre-recorded content short, digestible, di digital, on-demand demand content that is allowing um, us to focus on particular topics. One topic, for example, is dispelling the myth that Peace Corps is free, right? And dressing uh, an inner city, if you will, or, or, or um, communities where Peace Corps is not infiltrating and saying, yeah, you got to buy Chacos or Tiva sandals and backpacks and you know all the accoutrement that goes with being a volunteer, then Peace Corps is not free, right? <laughs> and so it really talks about and has the voice on these video vignettes of uh, former volunteers, particularly volunteers of color, um, who are saying, here's how I managed that. Here's how I navigated that. So the RPCV world is critical to our uh, growing this kind of digestible information. And when the, the questioner asks for schools, um, this is pitched towards college, but there's no reason with the um, resources we have that we can't vary the level and start getting into junior high schools and et cetera. Um, and I'm sure there's a recruiter out there on this, on this call who's saying, Darlene, you're committing us to what? <laughs> But it's exciting stuff, and, and you turn this creativity over to our teams, and all kinds of things can happen. A great question. I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, Miriam, you're in the, for the younger generation. Do you think that would be useful to have something like that? I think it'd be great to have a kind of a Zoom or some kind of thing like that that you can show students and young people. Yeah, definitely. And now being virtual, I feel like that would be a great way you know, to get, I think this is definitely changing the landscape. We're even more virtual than we were before. <laughs> so. Well, histor historically, postcards were sent. There were postcards sent to volunteers in the 60s with a picture of Shirley Chisholm on him, right? And kind of inspiring and saying, oh my goodness, this, this, this is a great thing to do to serve peace in the world, right? And now we can do it in the virtual world and ping every phone, in a university at one time, that, that opens up a world of uh, possibilities. Well, it sounds like there's a, we have some takeaways, huh? <laughs> it sounds like something that would really be good to really think about. 
Um, so I'm going to turn, we have five minutes left. I'm going to turn it back over to Glenn. I think you have some closing remarks and thoughts. Well, first and foremost, thank you, Ambassador Jenkins, for leading this conversation and for your leadership in this arena and all that you have done uh, toward peace building and for diversity and inclusion in the, the peace building community. Thank you so much for your partnership with the Peace Corps and the Peace Corps community. We're very grateful for that and just so thankful that uh, you know we've been able to join arms in, in this important work that's being done. Um, also would like to thank all the panelists for joining us again. I know we each, we all have busy days and I appreciate your taking the time to be a part of this conversation. Uh, these synergies and complementarities between our organizations are what we want to continue to capitalize on. And really, I think we all hold the same vision and value and that is the best Peace Corps possible and, and the best experience for Peace Corps volunteers and, and all of us to have the opportunity to do the work that is um, uh, before us. As, as Peace Corps celebrates its 60th anniversary, we know that, that it has to emerge a, a new and, and, and better organization and that the, the conditions on the ground have changed and uh, the uh, arena of, uh, of our work has changed. I, I really wanna just first and foremost commend um, uh, on behalf of the Peace Corps, Darlene uh, and the leadership at the Peace Corps for the progress that they already have been making. Um, the community, the Peace Corps community speaks loud and clear many times to the agency in, in terms of expectations. And that goes to NPCA as well and, and NPCA to Peace Corps. But uh, it, it is clear and obvious that the Peace Corps is listening and working hard in this time, hopefully, which is a brief hiatus of, of volunteers being in the field to really make those programs uh, recalibrated uh, better in the field to incorporate diversity and inclusion and equity into a greater extent in uh, the recruitment of volunteers, the staffing of the Peace Corps and the support to volunteers in the field. And of course the return Peace Corps volunteers, which is where National Peace Corps Association also comes in. Uh, so thank you, um, Darlene, and for the leadership over at Peace Corps uh, on the work that you're doing there. I, I noted in particular, you, you highlighted the uh, increase in uh, reimbursement for medical costs for applicants, which you know this is certainly a barrier to many people of color to enter into the Peace Corps who, who may not have the resources to cover those expenses. There's a lot to be done there. There's a lot of recommendations. I know in the report that we uh, uh, developed with our community that the, the community has essentially authored. And uh, there's a lot of work for both the agency and for NPCA and for the Peace Corps community ahead. Uh, I, I really wanna thank especially the Peace Corps community uh, and the peace building community, uh, whether or not you're part of the Peace Corps itself um, or have been for driving this conversation and, and, and holding us accountable and holding us responsible for bringing about the changes that, that we need to see. Uh, we welcome your inputs. I, I've seen a lot of comments and questions here in the chat bar. I know there's more to come. You know, we just ask you to continue to let us know um, what's important and, and uh, continue this conversation. Uh, you know where to find me, um, Glenn at rpcv.org and the rest of our team is available to you uh, to help respond to to any questions or anything that weren't covered here in the conversation today. And, um, you know, there's a, a, a phrase from John F. Kennedy that I was thinking about as we talked about this. Um, you know, this all starts with us. And John F. Kennedy, I think, said it best. He said, even one person can make a difference and everyone should try. And so there's a lot of work, you know, when it comes down to it, um, whether it's, uh, whether we're the, the leader of the Peace Corps agency or we're a recruiter or we're a, a Peace Corps applicant or a university student, uh, there's there's much to be done here, and each of us are going to do our part in helping make the world a better place. Um, but there is there is really important work that we have to do to improve our institutions and our organizations so that that experience is is what it is intended to be. I'll ask you just to, if you haven't already, sign up uh, to to join the Orgs and Solidarity Commitments uh, for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. If you're not involved in any way uh, with the uh, National Peace Corps Association. We're going to be doing a lot of advocacy work on, on these issues and you don't have to be a Peace Corps volunteer or return volunteer or, or, or any particular um, person as long as you care about uh, the Peace Corps and, and the values that it stands for. And if you care about peace building, sign up for NPC and, and see what the issues are that we're working on um, in, in support of our community and in support of a better world. And uh, join us when we advocate and join us when we uh, get in the trenches and do the work that has to be done. So. Thank you again so much for everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Ambassador Jenkins. Thank you, Sajid and Michael and Darlene for joining us. And again, a very special thank you for Miriam 
my colleague uh, here at NPCA for her fabulous job in organizing and leading uh, this event. Take care and have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.